If you found yourself walking along Union Avenue in Rochester, New York, you'd probably notice the calm street, nice two-way cycle track, and a mix of new housing with some historic buildings. It's just a really nice example of urbanism in an older U.S. city. You probably wouldn't be able to tell that it used to look like this, the Interloop Expressway with six lanes of highway traffic sandwiched between two frontage roads. That's what it looked like 10 years ago. But before then, Rochester leaders realized that the inner loop was designed to carry traffic for a city much larger than what Rochester had shrunk to and no longer seemed necessary for regional commuters. It also created a formidable barrier, like a noose around downtown. The seed for removal was planted in the city's comprehensive plan back in 1999, and after 18 years of community outreach, engineering, and construction, a section of the inner loop was filled in and replaced with a nice street and much needed urban housing. It's considered one of the most successful highway teardowns in the United States, and it has been so successful that the city is in the planning stages of removing the rest of the inner loop. The Congress for the New Urbanism catalogs the most endangered highways in their Freeways Without Futures report, published every couple years. They published the first report in 2008 and included 10 highways that they felt could be torn down. Of those 10, three have been removed, including the Alaskan Way Viaduct, which I did a video on a few years ago. The Sheridan Expressway in the Bronx became Sheridan Boulevard. And Route 34 in New Haven, Connecticut once split downtown and has since been re-stitched, with another phase planned for 2025. A few more of the original 10 are moving toward removal. Interstate 81, which cut downtown Syracuse off from its neighborhoods, looks to finally be making progress towards removal after a lot of back and forth, which we'll get to later in the video. New Jersey's Route 29 cuts Trenton off from the Delaware River, and the city received a grant in 2023 to study its removal and conversion to a boulevard. Buffalo Skyway remains in limbo, unable to achieve consensus about what to do with it. The rest of the highways on this list are still there with progress stalled. Now, Rochester's inner loop project didn't make the initial 2008 Freeways Without Futures list, but it made the third list in 2012. The inner loop is one of the 15 highways in the United States and Canada to have been removed, according to the CNU. So for every successful removal, there are two to three endangered highways still hanging on, and countless more that could become endangered should public opinion shift. How do some highways stick around while others get removed? There are some common threads and lessons that local leaders and activists can learn from to turn their endangered highways into extinct highways. Let's talk about them after the bike bell. The first common thread you see when you look at that endangered highways list from 2008 is that with the exception of the Alaskan Way Viaduct in Seattle, all of them are on the eastern half of the US or Canada. Many of them are in cities that have lost population or have remained stagnant since they were constructed. The Buffalo region's population is now 1.2 million, down from a high of 1.3 million in 1970. Trenton's Delaware County is also down from its peak in 1970. Rochester's population grew quickly until 1970, and since then has been growing only at a percentage point or two per year. Population matters because many of these cities built their highways thinking that post-war urban growth and suburbanization would continue. People keep moving to the suburbs and working jobs in the central city. And highway departments are notorious for predicting increases in traffic that never materialize, even after the boom times have ended. This is one of my favorite graphs of all time. It was done by the Sightline Institute and shows the actual traffic counts for the State Route 520 bridge in Seattle in black. The State Highway Department's traffic projections are those absurd angled lines here. So what I'm saying is that highway traffic projections tend to be wildly optimistic to justify highway construction. Now, if they're wildly optimistic now, you can only imagine what they were like back when Rochester was growing like gangbusters between 1950 and 1960, when the inner loop was being constructed. The bottom line here is that population matters. If you live in a city with declining or stagnant population growth, your highway network is probably overbuilt. And that's gonna be especially true if your principal city has been hollowed out by decades of suburbanization. In 1950, Rochester was home to over two thirds of the metro area population. Today, the population of the city of Rochester is about 20% of the entire region. The urban loop freeways are just not as necessary, as increasingly trips are being made from suburb to suburb instead of suburb to city. Fewer people mean fewer cars, duh. This is a key ingredient though for highway teardowns. A typical large US highway can carry 200,000 vehicles per day. Rochester's inner loop was carrying 7,000 vehicles per day before it was torn down. For reference, your suburban arterial street with fast food restaurants and big box stores likely carries 20 to 30,000 vehicles per day. This is a big reason why nobody really missed the inner loop when it was gone. There's nobody really using it in the first place. Low traffic volumes can also make it easier for transportation engineers to make a case for removing a highway and replacing it with a street or boulevard. Union Street, the former inner loop, is a perfect design for only a few thousand cars per day. 
Busier streets like the Embarcadero in San Francisco are designed as busier boulevards, but are still way better than the highway that existed before. Okay, we've got population and traffic counts. What else does a city need to remove a highway? Well, political support is huge. Those factors can go a long way to convincing politicians to support a removal, but there are some other factors too. Politicians are sometimes swayed by showing that the area the highway consumes could be converted into a better use. Many urban highways were built along waterfronts, which today are considered valuable real estate, either for new development or parks. The classic example is Harbor Drive in Portland, Oregon. It was built in 1950, but by the 1970s, it was only carrying about 25,000 vehicles per day, well within the capacity of an urban boulevard. A park and boulevard option was approved, and in 1978, the conversion happened. Just a note to politicians, if you're responsible for a highway teardown like Oregon Governor Tom McCall, they'll name a beautiful park after you. Not a bad deal. Certainly better than the highway being named after you, which many highways are. Gross. Politicians might not be swayed by a park, though. What about good old-fashioned economic development? Milwaukee, Wisconsin replaced a 1.3-kilometer stretch of highway with McKinley Boulevard. They reinstated the street grid and created a plan for redevelopment of an area that has been pretty depressed thanks to the highway. The resulting transformation of the area helped generate $1 billion in downtown economic development. Not bad for a highway demolition that cost $25 million. The deal gets even better when you find out that it would have cost 50 to 80 million to repair the highway instead of removing it. If you have all of these factors working in your favor, then it's pretty easy to make a case for a highway teardown. But if you're missing even one or two of the factors I mentioned, it gets much harder. One of the best examples of this is from our Freeways Without Futures list from 2008, and that's Highway 81 in Syracuse. On paper, this removal should be a slam dunk. It's a small city that invites comparison to its nearby neighbor, Rochester. Syracuse is a little smaller, but it's still your typical upstate New York City. It saw explosive growth in the first part of the last century, but has largely tapered off. Suburbanization has taken its toll on the central city too. Back in the 1960s, the New York Department of Transportation built I-81 as an elevated viaduct through the city, particularly in black and Jewish areas, home to many lower income residents. Today, it's crumbling and in dire need of repair. Local leaders and activists have also argued that the rift in the community created by the highway also needs repair and proposed removal instead of renovation. This was not the first choice of the state DOT who initially proposed putting the highway in a tunnel similar to another famous highway project, Boston's Big Dig. It was quickly and obviously rejected as being too expensive. To their credit, the state DOT pivoted to a plan advocated for by many Syracusans called the Community Grid. This plan would replace the highway with a boulevard called Almond Street, the name of the original street the highway destroyed. It would reconnect the two sides with new surface roads and better pedestrian and bike facilities. In 2021, Syracuse Mayor Ben Walsh and New York Governor Andrew Cuomo supported the Community Grid plan and the state budgeted about half the necessary funds to complete the project and begin phase one. Then in 2022, a judge granted a temporary injunction halting the project. A community group called Rebuild 81 brought the case, hoping to stop the community grid option and instead rebuild 81 as it is today with a few additions. This includes a strange looking skyway proposal that I can't tell if they're being serious about. They argue that the highway is a necessary piece of infrastructure and many businesses along it rely on it. In addition, regional leaders want to keep it because regional commuting is really important to them and they don't care as much about the people who live right along the highway. Furthermore, I-81 still carries 100,000 vehicles, a far cry from the 7,000 before they replace the inner loop. The good news is that the five judge panel recently overturned that lower court decision to halt the project. Renew 81 said they would appeal, but as of right now, the highway removal project remains on track. The governor praised the decision and the state and local government remains committed to tearing it down. The Syracuse example shows how tricky it can be to remove a highway when it has everything going for it, except that it still carries a lot of people and supports a lot of businesses. Organized opposition will form and they'll do a lot to delay the project like they're doing for 81. The other lesson here is that local activism, both for and against, can make or break a project. It might be one of the most important factors in highway removal. The Claiborne Avenue Alliance is fighting for the removal of the Claiborne Expressway in New Orleans. The Restore Our Community Coalition is aiming to tear down the Kensington Expressway and restore an Olmstead Greenway back to its former glory in Buffalo. The organization Connect Oakland is pushing for a vision that replaces I-980 with a multimodal boulevard that reconnects the city grid. I'll post links to these organizations and more like them in the description. If you live in these cities, consider joining the organization and throwing your support their way. If you live in a city that needs a highway teardown and no organization exists, consider starting one. 
Highways live or die in large part due to public opinion, and you can help shape the narrative. This video comes from a lot of personal experience I've had with endangered or extinct highways. I've traveled to visit the Embarcadero in San Francisco, the Big Dig in Boston, I-81 in Syracuse, just to name a few. And whenever I'm traveling, I have with me a Bellroy backpack. I actually have two, two different sizes. Uh, this one right here is, is the smaller one. It's also my everyday carry. So I'm a college professor, so I'm around a lot of students with backpacks, and I wanted my backpack to be a little bit more adult and professional, and I think Bellroy fits the bill. And uh, I've had this backpack for two years, it still looks great and works awesome. I mean, it's literally the dream of YouTubers to get sponsored by companies whose products we already love, and this is the case with Bellroy. I've been using them for years, uh, I swear by them, I own multiple bags, uh, and I'm so happy they're supporting this channel. They actually didn't start with backpacks, but first started making slim wallets, which is what I would recommend to you if you want to try them out, but don't want to dive into a backpack right away. Bellray are also just really great at figuring out how to organize the stuff you carry. They make key organizers, cable and tech organizers, pouches, and more. As Bellroy are a certified B Corp, you can be sure they're environmentally and socially responsible too. They invest in the use of recycled materials in a lot of the products they make, and they use eco and dry tanned leather, which is drastically better for the environment than the status quo. This bag here was made with recycled water bottles. I'd rather have those water bottles like supporting my laptop than contaminating the ocean. A wallet or backpack would make a great gift for you or just for yourself. So go check out Bellroy. I can't recommend them enough.